Do you know what? I love fellow nerds because we're really enthusiastic about stuff unless we're asked to participate. <laughs> is everyone having a really good time? Yeah, it's lush here. Look, it is, it is lush here. Um, we were at um, MCM London a couple of weeks ago and I'm sorry, but the costume and cosplay level in Birmingham is so much better. Um, I've seen some amazing stuff uh, over the past like couple of minutes. It's been incredible. Uh, so we are Roll the Damn Dice. We're an actual play D&D &D podcast. Uh, we have been going for just over a year, uh, and we are in the second season of <laughs> what we call the Just Us League. Um, our group, rather than... Bat joining together to battle the forces of evil are a little bit more, well, what's in it for me? Which says a lot about our characters, I think. Um, my name is Joy Amy Avery. Um, I will be moderating. Um, I also play a dragonborn paladin called Carouser Morn, who has a particular love of pinked ice ring donuts and biscuits and uh, puppies particularly fond of puppies. So I'm going to go around the crew and ask them to introduce themselves and who they are playing currently in the campaign. Uh, if we can start with Stephen. Hello, I'm Stephen, um, and I'm playing Rothgon, the Damhire, Tiefling, Warlock, Sorcerer. And yes, I've had a lot of shade about that over the past 24 hours, um, and I will not be taking questions on it. Thank you. Thanks. I'm allowed to talk as well, Stephen. My name is Moa Myerson. I am playing uh, currently Blue, uh, the human fighter and rogue. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorted. Uh, I'm Luke Robbins and I'm playing Ratsnick, the deep gnome necromancer. He's a wonderfully grubby little critter. So. Hi, I'm uh, Connor Hurrigan, and I'm playing Grongle, the uh, really stabby little uh, goblin rogue cleric. I forgot what I was playing then. <laughs> Good uh, thing about roleplay. Hi, I'm Paul Avery, and I play everyone else. Ooh. I'm the DM. <laughs> Just a oh, bit of DM us. humor for you. So uh, we're here today to talk to you about uh, some roleplay hints and tips. Um, a lot of us have got quite a, a long history background in D&D, &D, but also most of us also have a history in performing and acting. So we thought as that seems to be our strong point, uh, we would help out wherever we can. Um, so I know that for a lot of people, they haven't done any kind of performing stuff and role play is really Im important in D&D. &D. So what I'd ask, like to ask you guys is, do you have any tips for kind of breaking the ice with new players or players who might be a little bit nervous about going into the role play? How do you help somebody along with that? Uh, more. Um, so I'm probably the newest in terms of like D&D experience. I literally only started playing D&D a year and a bit ago for this podcast. Um, so for me, I come at it from a very actor place. And I just, I find a voice and I lean into it. And I'm a very much like, just go for it. And, um, but I think to start off with, it's about like checking in with your team checking in with the other people in your group and just kind of being like, are we all on the same page with role play? Because I don't want to come in with my really terrible Irish accent and like really go for it. And you guys are just sort of like not keen. So I think it's kind of, yeah, making sure we're all on the same page and then maybe like having a go with like someone else and then sort of like, and then you end up realizing it's really fun and you get to be silly and not being like self-conscious. I think is the big thing. And like making sure you're all on the same page. It's all safe. No one's gonna tease you for your terrible Irish accent. And Let's be clear about your terrible Irish accent, <laughs> shall we? I, yeah. It isn't a terrible Irish accent because there is no island on the Thousand Island continent. She's from the Grey Lakes. This is a fantastic Grey Lakes accent and I will not hear anything else about it. <laughs> Thanks, Moore. Uh, chaps? Oh, I, I was just gonna say, um, I take a while to warm up into a character. I'm really good at concepts, um, but then I will get halfway through the session and go, who is this person and why don't I know them? 
especially their voice. So um, recently I've discovered just having a something you can fall back on um, helps you sort of relax a little bit. So the character I'm playing is Strahd at the moment. I've only been playing him a few weeks. He's a vegan. So every time the DM's there going, oh, and you've got your usual sort of suggestible meat broth. Yeah, but what's the vegan option now? Yeah, but like, I'm a vegan, so what, 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 you know, any carrots? Like, that'll do. Um, and that just relaxes me by having that silly little thing. Rothgon had his book of souls where he was collecting names. So a lot of my role play revolved around how am I going to get this um, DM character, NPC, non-playable character, um, to sign the book and hand over his soul. So that's what I do. I just have these silly little things that I do until I relax and then forget about that thing that I did. <laughs> I think as well, it's very easy to think of roleplay as uh, doing a, a, a Grey Lake accent or um, being this thing. But by playing the game, you're roleplaying. If you, you know, if you say, "I want to go to this guy and stab him," you're making a decision based on your character. It doesn't need to be big or scary. And there are like you said, Moa, there are different levels of comfort. So just do what's comfortable to you, and then take a step further. Try doing a silly voice, or try describing what your character does in a little more detail. It'll take you miles and miles and miles. You'll be be surprised at how quickly you get into those comfort zones by just expanding what you've taken. Yeah, for me it would be more emphasis similar off Mo's opinion on finding a group that you're comfortable in is such a huge that breaks down a lot of barriers. If you're with friends or people you're comfortable with and things like that, that helps a hell of a lot for the role play. Um, another one would be work with your DM, uh, starting the campaign, get a little plot hook that relates to your character then you've got a reason to step in and be like, oh, I know this guy. I've been to this inn before type thing. That can just give you a little spotlight time that you don't feel like you're interrupting on anyone else because it's meant for you. Uh, yeah, and I would say um, Session Zero is really, really useful. Um, so Session Zero is your pre-session before you start planning. You all get together. You all go, well, this is the character I'm thinking of. This is... The DM can talk about the world. And then you can test out where people are at with how much they want to role play, how much they want to get into it. Some of you play D&D and you want to play D&D and the role play is low. I'm guessing you're here at a role playing thing because you're interested in role playing. But hey, the game is your game and you, you guys need to choose between you how you're going to play it. Um, my other thing is I think it's a trust exercise role playing and um, you have to learn to trust the group you're with and just push yourself out a little bit. You don't have to go whole hog from day one. Cool, some nice things there. Um, so how do you, and how, so in effect, how do you suggest to other people? How do you go about getting into a character before you start playing? Or do you just rock up and just get your character sheet out and be like, right, I'm gonna start playing? Or do you do stuff to like prep before you go? I mean, I could answer, cause um, it's a very quick one. I am terrible. I'll have backstory, image, look, banging bog down. Um, but I'll be like, oh no, what's the accent? What, what, what's the personality? And that stuff I'll figure out as I go. Um, with blue, I do my makeup and uh, pretend to like talk at myself about all of the crimes that I've committed um, and just like, get myself, like helps me get into the, the accent a bit. And um, it also like just mellows me out because I, I don't know if you've noticed, I'm quite high energy. And um, she's a little bit more kind of, centered, so that helps me. Whereas I've got another character who is higher energy than I am currently, so I drink a pint of coffee and, and just kind of roll with it and like fly, like turn my brain off and let whatever is in my head just out. So you're suggesting drugs? No. <laughs> just to be clear, we are not suggesting drugs. No. <laughs> no. I don't think I've actually told any of you this story yet for Grongle. Oh, this uh, is exciting. Yeah, I kept Ooh. it quiet. Um, but I, I realized I was going like the whole week, because we, we play weekly, and I just not do the voice throughout the week. It's, it's, uh, it's a little embarrassing. It's, um, I mean, it talks like this. So if you're doing that at work or on the bus, people tend to look at you a bit funny. Um, but I was really, it was taking me about an hour to get into it, and he was just having like one word thing. So I, um, I, I sat in my bathroom one day with the lights off and did Hamlet's <laughs> is this a dagger I see before me. I mean, that's <laughs> Macbeth. Oh my God. I mean, that's Macbeth, Connor. Oh, Macbeth, sorry, sorry. I mean, right. I know you're not all classically oh. trained, but oh. really. Faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> 
Um, my little one would just be posture at the table, helps. Um, so for Rat Snake, again, he's very sort of grubby and grimy and skitterish. So whilst we're sat at the table, I will like it hunch over and or just the movements and the posture helps. Like if you are playing a uh, like a posh regal character, like just slouching and leaning back, you'll find like the mannerisms and the voice add, come along with it naturally as well. So that's my little way. Uh, yeah, from uh, who who DMs here? Yeah, so sometimes nice, big respect. <laughs> you do so all sometimes the work. you work on a character beforehand, and you're like, I've got this guy. This NPC is amazing, and then they never speak to the NPC, right? You've a full backstory. You know their mum's name and everything, uh, and then other times they just go up to an NPC. You're like, no, don't speak to that NPC. I don't know their voice or their name or anything about them. Um, so I like to have some. Uh, stereotypes um, just around I'm going to say I like stereotypes around race but that's okay within the context of D&D right um, so for orcs all orcs come from South London so they all speak like that and I'm an orc obviously and that's how I speak and then I just make a couple of decisions in my head high status low status and um, just if you've got I think if you've got a couple of thoughts in the back of your head about what they do when they get off work and uh, what's in their backstory. Um, that's, that just helps you to really get into that character, I think, off the back. Off the bat? Is it off, off the, the bat? bat? Off the bat. Um, I find, actually find um, a prop really helpful. Uh, so I have a character uh, who is constantly drinking. So I bought myself a tankard. Um, which I just took to the table because it was just better for me to be drinking my Dr. Pepper out of a tankard because I just felt more like I was in character with her, which I found helped. Um, so for you guys, because obviously role playing is about what you do, but it's also about what the other players do. So what does good role play etiquette mean to you guys? Um, because it can be quite tricky. I keep speaking first. So I no, this is fine. I, I was trying to do the thing which I was about to talk about, let other people speak. But then no one speaks, so I'm always the first. Moa, we were all here yesterday. We're giving you your space now. I tried to grab the mic off you, but you hit me. <laughs> I thought we weren't going to talk about that. Um, no, I, I think from, um, as someone who's always like got things to say and it's like, oh, that would be really funny and oh, that would be really good. No, I want, the, I want my character to do that. Sometimes it's about like taking a step back and like allowing other people to sort of do their thing because there will be the opportunity to say the witty thing or the joke or the, or the go to that shop or whatever. Um, and, if, and if it doesn't happen, if the opportunity doesn't like come around again, it's kind of okay. It's like the, there's a... There's a theatre term, um, like uh, kill your darlings. But I think, to be honest, it's like apl applicable through a lot of creative like arts or whatever. But to like the idea of like kill your darlings, like don't don't feel the need to like put everything in in one go. Like there'll be the other there'll be the opportunity at some point to do that thing. And and actually, what's more exciting is seeing your friends and their characters kind of coming alive and being able to interact off of that thing. Um, and yeah, that's cool. Recycle your darlings. Use them again, <laughs> if you didn't use it last time. Um, yeah, creating space is a really big thing. And I think that's one thing that I really like about this group. Um, everyone wants to be the protagonist. Everyone wants to be the main character. But you are a part of a collective. And it, uh, sometimes you've got to sit back and realize, hey, we're a group. The group's better than the individual. Let's, let's all do that together. But I think. Um, yeah, I think I think working as a group is, uh, to, to watch well, the common goal is, is what D&D is all about. Realising you are not the main character. Yeah, I know, yeah. I'm coming to that term. Yeah, <laughs> and I think I, I can build on that just by saying um, with Justice League, there has definitely been moments where we've all respected where the storyline might be going for that bit or that episode, and we all just sort of take a step back and let that person go. So when it was Rothgon meets the tieflings from his island, I was very much, I was very talkative that episode, but when Morn went off to um, meet Dragonborn in the Golden City, um, again, it was only Grongle that went with her and the rest of us sat out of that one. So we are quite good at, if, if the storyline seems to be geared at a player, let that player take that moment because that's what it's there for. And um, you'll you know, get your moment. Yeah, you will. And it's nice sometimes to be the um, 
guy stood behind that character going, yeah. <laughs> um, it's nice and relaxing. Um, yeah, I was going to say, there's a, a couple of things. Uh, my view of DMing, and I know people DM in different ways, um, but I would say um, you have to hold the, your story quite loosely. Um, if you want to write a novel, go and write a novel. F for me, DMing is about building a sandpit for players to play in. Um, and it can be annoying. We had a heist, we had a silly Christmas episode, which was, uh, I was gonna say loosely, but not very loosely, uh, based on Die Hard. I created an entire vent system. I pointed out the vents at every opportunity. Three of the characters are three foot tall. They never went in my vents. I am still furious, but I can't take that out on the players. Yeah, um, the problem is that the only person interested in the vents was the seven foot tall dragonborn who couldn't get in the vents. So I would say, uh, yeah, so I would say just hold the world lightly. And um, the other thing I've seen DMs do, which is you're not part of the team as a DM, they're the team. Don't create an NPC that follows them round everywhere. As have an, use NPCs to guide the story, give them extra plot points. You can bring in an NPC for an, a little bit, but I think if you have an NPC that joins the party, that just becomes a bit weird for the players. Um, I feel it's a DM's job just to build that open world for them to play in. Lovely. Um, so, as a DM, uh, we've got a few DMs here. Um, uh, Luke has been DMing for a really long time, and uh, Paul is our current DM. Connor's going to be DMing our next series. Um, I know Stephen's done some DMing as well. I wouldn't call it DMing. It was barely functioning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as a, as a DM, how do you kind of uh, promote interesting and creative role play if your characters are kind of struggling in that area? Go on, yeah, yeah, go on. I'll oh, fire off. Um, so my recent addition to my toolkit that I've had a lot of fun with is doing a like a light flash before their eyes. So I've had now when a player goes down and is rolling the death saving throws to see if they can hold on or pass on. Um, I'll just give them a question, something like, if your character was to die now, what would be their biggest regret? And then we all of a sudden get backstory and all sorts of stuff flooding from this character. And then, like, if it sort of inspires a bit of awe and a bit of role play, then I'll give them, I'll either, depend on how it is, I might just give them the successes they need so they're stable, or I might have that surge of adrenaline that brings them back up on one hit point and something like that I've had a lot of fun with. And then then they have a little bit of a uh, story to play on as well. Maybe they brewed on it over a couple sessions. So that's my newest um, trick for a DM. Um, I've got two that I kind of swear by, I think. Um, and the first one is uh, promote the behavior that you want to see. So uh, if your player takes a risk on something that, you know, is role play interestingly or uh, is quite creative, don't punish them for it. Like, you know, if they want to dive out of, uh, of a window and do a backflip and land on a thing, um, they're never going to do that again if you just take it away from them. If they fall flat on their face, and it's, uh, you know, you, you can fail without making the player feel bad. You, you, can, you can have a, a, a descending success. It could be, oh, you stumble, or, or, but you manage to land it, and you hurt your knees a little bit, and they're skinned up, but you get back up, and you, you do it again. Um, th that's the kind of thing that players want to do. They want to feel heroic. And the minute that you start rewarding with, with that, I'll move heaven and earth for my players if the, if the, if the story... If it's, if it's narrative and it's role play -y, um, and that's what I want them to do. The other thing as well is, uh, I think as a DM, we, we put a lot of work into world building. Uh, so we know what it looks like, but to the players, it's an, it's an endless void until we describe it. So um, especially in like combat and things like that, um, maybe have one of your uh, bad guys do something cool with some environment, and then suddenly the players go, oh, I can do something cool with the environment. I can jump into a barrel, or I can swing from the rafters. Um, and Ne by next turn, they'll all be doing it, guaranteed. Uh, one thing we've had a lot of fun with um, is uh, skill checks. I don't know if anyone's done skill checks as a show of hands. Anyone? A couple? Yeah, cool. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, skill checks is uh, where you set a scenario. It works really well in like a chase or um, when you're trying to escape. 
And what you say to the players is, okay, I'm not going to ask you. What I'm going to do is you have to do a skill check. So choose one of your 16 skills. Uh, so you might, they always, it's always athletics and acrobatics first, right? But then I don't let them use those skills again. So you're running away and there's a big log to jump over. I can't use acrobatics or athletics, no. I'm going to do a nature check to see how crumbly the log is. And it's real good fun. Um, and uh, you can just say, look, you've got to go. You do make tennis successes and you escape the wolves that are chasing you or, you know, uh, you know, you fail and you get mauled to death. Um, but it's a real fun way to do to make players think outside the box. We had one. We had Connor use uh, animal handling on uh, Joy Amy's squirrel folk um, to uh, achieve something. Oh, and Stephen. Um, Stephen int once intimidated grass. I, in I intimidated the ground. So what was happening was um, we, at certain spots we would step on, there was fire just erupting from the ground. I think my character had been hit about twice by the fire, failed every dex or climbing check to get away from it. So by the time the third one was coming for me, I was like, I'm going to roll for intimidation. <laughs> um, and just sort of pointed at the ground and said, no, you're not coming up. You're not going to set fire to me. You're going to stay in there. I've had, I've had a terrible day, and this keeps happening, so it's not happening no more. Um, something along those lines, and uh, it was like a 23 on yeah, intimidation. Yeah, you rolled like a nat 20, yeah. so <laughs> successfully <imit> <laughs> intimidated Scaring the, the ground. ground. Lovely. Um, so, uh, moving on from kind of skill checks and stuff, I know that sometimes people ask the question, like, do you prefer role play or combat? Which I think is an awkward question, because as far as I'm concerned, combat is role play. There's just more maths. Um, so how do you guys go about bringing more role play into your combat? I've not actually heard from you for a while more. It's okay. <laughs> You're allowed to speak. Um, so this was something that I really struggled with uh, with Blue. Because my first character um, that I'd ever played was a druid, because that's a sensible thing to do. Um, and I was so used to the sort of the magic, and it came really easily to, in combat to be like, oh, well, she casts this, and there's a big thing of light, and the wind rushes around. Because I think that I consume a lot of like fantasy, fiction, films, and books, so it's already like ready in my mind. Whereas when I started playing a fighter, and I had no magic, I was like, I oh, know, I hit. And and oh, this is a really I was really struggling the first couple of sessions. So I was like, it's really boring, and I don't like it. Um, but I had a chat with with my DM. I had a chat with other people who had played fighters, and it was this whole thing of like, but you can you can play with it. You can be you can add you can talk. You can add like um, thought process. And um, I mean, uh, Paul with the skill checks as well. At one point, it was like there was a banister leading into the room, and someone slid down the banister like Mary Poppins, and it was great. Um, and I was like, I'm going to do that. And so it was like, she slides down the banister and pulls out her bow and arrow. And I roll, and I had to roll athletics. I think I got like a 20. And so I was given an immediate hit to whatever it was. And it was like, ah, oh, cool, I'm going to do more of that. And yeah, it was sort of, it was, it made it more fun and it made me think a little bit more about. So kind of describing how Blue feels yeah. when she's like actually making the shot and stuff. Exactly. Uh, rather than, I don't know, I just fire an arrow and, oh, it doesn't hit. Okay, next go. Um, and you could just like add like a bit of emotion and you get more into it and you, and it just like, it just piles on from there. Stephen. So um, I would like to end my turn. And then the next thing I do is decide what that next turn is. Once I've established the rules are mostly correct um, and that that's the way to go forward, I will then start thinking about how does this look? How, how is this being pulled off? So one that I'm really proud of with uh, Rough Gone was he had a scroll that was for a homebrewed spell of blood rain. Now, obviously, you could just be like, oh, I, I cast blood rain and it starts raining blood. That's OK. Um, but it needed a bit of blood to activate the spell. So I made Rothgon eat the spell scroll, biting to his own tongue, so that gave him the blood to ignite the spell. Then for the rest of the combat, he was just face up to the sky, vomiting blood into the air that was just landing on everybody else. But it was really good because it was healing them and ripping damage away from the big bad evil guy. It, it, and I think your character was unconscious and a zombie was sent to fling you 
<laughs> into the blood so you wouldn't be unconscious anymore. Um, that was one of my finest moments, as disgusting as it sounds. I don't think I washed it off for three sessions. <laughs> I, I commanded you to wash it off, and then I got banished. Yeah, that happened. Um, I'm, I'm going to answer from a DM's point of view, I think. Um, sorry. Uh, and I think it's, it starts from the DM. So uh, theming is a really big thing for your fights. So yeah, random encounters are great and everything, but having it set up so that your players feel tense, the perception of this big, scary thing um, is, is much scarier than the actual damage the thing itself might do. So get them all tense, have them like walk down this uh, dark, spooky corridor as all these like, uh, the, the room creaks and drips around them and then they open this big like ah! door into this room and it's huge. And then that set up a fight for them right there. And then have the, have the bad guy interact with the players on the turn. It doesn't have to be necessarily a, an attack, but have them react and have them mock the player or have them laugh at their spell or, or you know, however, they, however you want the, the player to be, but just stick to this theme that you have for the battle and the, the players will follow suit. Nine t times out of ten. I can, I'm going to answer as a player. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, when we start our new, we start our new campaign in January. So you know, if that's, that's a good place for you to jump into the podcast, just saying. Um, and I play a um, dragonborn paladin. I did it first. Uh, <laughs> uh, who's called Lord Torrandar, and he speaks like this the whole time. Uh, but he views the whole world as a hierarchy. So if he's entering a fight with things he thinks are going to be easy for him to hit hard with his hammer. He will trudge in and like do it sort of, I don't really care. Like this is easy, they're just skeletons. And uh, I think all I want, the point I wanted to make was that um, describing how your character does it and why they're doing it is fun for you, fun for the DM and uh, really helps. I, I think describing why a character's doing something helps the DM to understand your crazy decision-making process, and you know, then go, oh, okay, cool. I get that they're really upset about this thing. That's why they doubled down on that zombie unnecessarily. There's also this, um, uh, it's really good to communicate with the other characters when you're doing combat. Um, it's often a long time before it comes back round to your go again. You can think about what you're going to shout to the other characters. So, uh, for instance, the, the characters that we're playing in our campaign that start in January, uh, we've used the characters before. And my character and Steven's character have a kind of tag team thing where he will throw a trident into an enemy and my character will cast heat metal. Um, so little things like that, if you can think about what abilities the other characters have that you could possibly use together, I think that makes a, makes a really good role play in combat. Sorry, I'm, it was meant to be you, wasn't it? That's all right, that's okay. Can't shut um, me up. Mine is, again, like, I find magic's normally a bit of an easier one to go fancy on the descriptions. Uh, but I've had a lot of fun as well with melee characters engaged in battle. Uh, one I'll always remember we had... Uh, my, I was DMing and I had a bandit run up to a player with a sword and shield and rolled to hit and missed their armor class. So the player on their turn took that as the miss was them bashing the, with their shield, bashing the sword wide and leaving them open. So their rolling to hit was then thrusting the sword forward into an opening. They hit and then on my turn with the bandit, I had the bandit like jump backwards to get off the sword and then he tried something and just being descriptive, if you've got a DM that's up for it, going backwards and forwards and just having your own little cinematic moment, um, that's a lot of fun to do as a fighter as well. Lovely. Um, we are going to throw it out to you guys um, for any questions you've got in a minute. Uh, so have a little think on that. Um, in the meantime, guys, just quickly, how do you deal with... How shall I put it? Um, uh, yeah, that's just what my character would do um, as a way of, you know, there's that player who just kind of messes up everything that you've just all spent hours trying to achieve just with those words. Yeah, but that's what my character would do. How do you deal with that? So mine's really straightforward. I think about my actual life and there's a series of things that I don't want to do. That's get out of bed that's go to work, that's speak to a family member, that's cook myself any meals. 
I have to do them anyway because that's just what's happening in my life. So your character has to do what's in front of them because that is what's going on in their life. And just standing there going, well, I don't want to do this. You can't call him sick to work going, sorry, it's just not in my character to do that today. <laughs> I mean, if, if you've done that and got away with it, then kudos and um, like mad respect. But yeah, it, it's, that's just not how real life works. So put a bit of realism into it, and that's the situation that's in front of them. What are they going to do? Lovely. Anyone else? Um, I would say um, uh, carrot, uh, carrot and stick, really. So um, the, the, this team are a complete bunch of murder hobos. Uh, they don't do what you want them to do at any one at any point. And I really wanted them to become bodyguards for this super powerful group. Um, so I was like, how are we going to do this? And I chatted with Mo, actually. And um, we basically decided the group, the super powerful group, would just discuss in front of them how they didn't want them to be bodyguards. So they were going, no, we don't want them. No, they're rubbish. Look at that one. That's too scrawny. And this guy's just like, no, we want to join. No, we're joining. We're really good. And uh, so I think that's the sort of carrot, work out their motivations. And then... If they carry on, the stick comes out. <laughs> you we you know. Uh, Stephen, I'm going to show you. Stephen was pretending to be a waiter. He was supposed to be in disguise. He was the worst waiter on earth. And he was really like, go on then, DM. Go on. And uh, yeah, I just punished him in the end. To be fair, I'm actually a waiter. That's what I was doing for my day job at the time. I was getting really upset and stressed about it. So I just took the opportunity to say what I would say to customers if I was allowed to in the real world. <laughs> Lovely. Right. Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna venture out into the crowd with you guys. Oh no, we've got Daisy. We've got our lovely Daisy is gonna come and find you. So stick your hand in the air if you've got a question for any of the panel or just a general question. Oh. Well, London had all their hands up. <laughs> oh, lovely. Brilliant. Right. Yes. Sometimes as a DM, I find that I have to take a break to figure out what's going on next. And I like, I sort of sit there and go, well, can you guys, is there anything you guys want to do as I'm trying to figure out? And they don't want to really engage. Is there any way I can get them to engage a little bit more? So that's if, if your players uh, d aren't kind of engaging with the stuff that you've set out, how do you get your players to kind of engage with the story? That's a really good question, and I'm not sure there's a definitive answer. Um, you, can do, you can do one thing at the table and one thing outside of. So talk to your players and see what's engaging them. They, they, they just genuinely might not like the, sa the same type of game that you're running, and, and that's okay. If they want to just have like a, a military strategic combat scenario, maybe they're not right for the table, and, and that is absolutely fine. Um, but also throw plot hooks to them that are relevant or find um, things in their backstory that might fit with the current um, plot line. So you might be exploring someone else's backstory doing this whole grand arc that you've got planned, but throw in like a letter from a loved one or um, and just some little tidbit would go a really long way with your players if they think that they're being catered to. Uh, and, and as soon as they do that, reward them and make them feel wonderful because um, that's what they want. They want to feel like the center of attention. We want to feel special. <laughs> yeah, like, make your players feel special. Yeah. yeah. I would say if you're playing and it's a t t table at home, you can always go, guys, I need 10 minutes. Go and have a fag. Go and have a cup of tea. I just need to get my place. Um, the other thing is just give them mysteries that are, are nothing. We had, um, we, we had a thing, a big long thing where they were trapped in this building and they had to find clues and every clue I'd set was a big trap. And, um, and then the last clue was just stuck on the big, on a ceiling of a room. Honestly, an hour later, they discovered they just had to take it off the ceiling of the room because they like a mystery. If you go, there's a trap door in the corner <laughs> and just, then you can do your notes and then they go, oh, what's this? What's that? You know, and you, you can go do an investigation check and all. I just want to back up what Connor said really quickly. Um, he is completely, he's so good at this. He's completely derailed the path that my character's on with just saying the two words, daddy's coming. And that's just changed my character's complete MO and what he's focused on just with two words. Okay, uh, we got any more questions from the room? Ah, yep, yeah, lovely, down here. Oh, sorry, we'll, we'll bring you a microphone. <laughs> There you go. Okay, um, hold, 
I'm assuming we're talking about Dungeons and Dragons. So how, what are your tips on becoming the best Dungeon Master? Oh, tips on becoming the best Dungeon Master. Let's hand it over. Let's hand it over. I mean, yeah. Yeah. probably like... Um, we're the panel. You guys tell us why you're the best Dungeon Master. <laughs> I mean, they're not. It's Luke, clearly. <laughs> oh, no, I think um, the first one for me would be backstories from players. So if you can, all your players, if you can just get them a little something, a little plot hook, um, so you can bring in a hometown or a childhood friend, something like that into your game. Um, but to start with, I think the absolute ground rule is a good relationship with your players, not their character, your players, because then if there's something bothering them or something they're not comfortable with or somewhere they want to go or something they want to do, you want them to be able to approach you and not just like be in silence about it. Being friendly and open to your players is a, a huge, huge first step. Excellent, a great question. Um, oh, Connor's got something he wants to say. What would you like to say, Connor? Well, I'm, I'm just salty about not being the best dungeon master. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the DM in this situation. The, the, the only thing I was going to say was about um, you, your character's the world as the DM. Uh, that's the thing that you should be focusing on. Uh, you should be the least interesting player, but the most interesting backdrop. You should have uh, this wonderful, creative thing that players might not even look at, this vent system that Paul created. Brilliant, uh, but we never went down it. So um, providing your players the world to live in is, is your job, and I think making that as beautiful and as wonderful as you can is what I consider to be the best DM. Or become Matt Mercer. Those are your yeah. options. <laughs> Lovely. Anyone else? Any more? Oh, yep. Super duper. Oh, oh over there. <laughs> Brilliantly sparkly top. Who thought of the concept for the game? Ah, who thought of the concept for, for Roll the Damn Dice? I suppose it just kind of came out of playing. There was a group of us playing together, and we realized how much fun we were having. And we're like, well, would other people have fun listening to us? So we had a go at recording it um, and just put it out there, just thinking that maybe one or two people would listen to it who uh, maybe couldn't get to a game. Sometimes it's difficult to find a game that's playing at the moment. Um, it's often difficult to sort out people's schedules. So to have something that's coming out weekly, that's like part of a campaign. And sometimes we do things where we try and involve the listeners as well. So we've done charity streams where people could donate a little amount to put in like an NPC or um, Luke DM'd a special for us where they could uh, basically pay to put in obstacles or help. A bit like the Hunger Games, really. You can either send something in that's going to save someone or send them a horrible, horrible beast um, and kind of do that. So it kind of grew out of everyone, really. This particular campaign is is Paul's creation. Yeah, we, we sort of... Um, so it's uh, created... It comes back to what Luke saying. The main part of the world is it's created from the characters' backstories. So we asked all the characters for their backstories and where they came from and... Uh, Moa's had a couple of characters that come from Shuffle Stumps, and Joy Amy has some, uh, a character that comes from Corellan's Wood. I've got a character that comes from the Golden Isle. So now you have a world which has a place called Corellan's Wood and Shuffle Stumps and the Golden Isle. And then uh, Connor and I DM in the same world. Um, so we world build around that predominantly, and the players' backstories create the world. I mean, this actual campaign came from a one-shot um, we, we couldn't play the regular game we, could, we wanted to play. Uh, so Paul said, hey, why don't we all get around and do a one-shot? And so we all created these characters with a one-shot in mind, and then suddenly they're on a whole campaign. And anyone who's done both knows that a one-shot character is very different <laughs> to creating a campaign character. Um, so suddenly we were all like, oh, oh, uh, backstory, uh, um, morals. Ah, uh, where is all this coming from? Um, yeah, it can come from anywhere. Fine, I'll stop setting people on fire. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and there was a, a question here, I think. Yep, Daisy's coming to you. Thank you. Um, as a player, sometimes I can find that you're almost in a way you've, you're trying to get your character to do something and either you're trying to balance between not interacting too much to give people their own time to play and sometimes just you're way too involved with the plot. How do you balance that as players and as a DM? 
Um, I think that might be a good question for Stephen, actually, because he's had quite a lot of, uh, his character's had quite a lot of intense stuff mm. happen this season. Yeah, so um, as we develop these one-shot characters into long-term campaign characters, um, and Paul was like, right, give me some backstory to work from. So I've had a lot of fun with Rothgon, the guy with the wings and the horns, because um, he just set fire to people he didn't like. Um, which is something I wish I could have brought into my real life, but apparently that's a crime. Um, but that's the, that was the chaotic side I wanted to play to him. But with hanging out with Blue and Morn especially, them having that chaotic but good side to them, um, you know, he's now in a place where he kind of like thinks, maybe there are consequences for my actions, maybe I do have responsibilities that I have to face, maybe hanging out with these guys is making me a better person, although he wouldn't admit that out loud. He is at a point now where he kind of wants to impress them and be their friend and to be accepted by them. So he's thinking he's found his people. So it's a real character shift. Um, but yeah, I'm just always very wary that um, anything to do, there's an organization that Blue is a part of that Morn's kind of being inducted to. When it's that kind of storyline, I take a step back from that because there's no need for my gags, one-liners, arsony um, to be happening at that point. Um, but when it is clear, like we're talking about tieflings and um, cultism and stuff, then that's when it's like, okay, this is me. This is what I know. I can take a bit of a center stage and these guys have got my back literally standing behind me going, yeah. And I was just going to quickly add, I think it's a real DM responsibility. It's a big part of being a great DM um, is to know some of your quiet characters some of you'll have noticed from the stage, some of these guys are much louder and excitable and they will talk and they will have fun. And they want to know that they've got freedom to do that and know when I've decided that they've spoken enough, I'll go, okay, and we'll move on. And Luke is our best player and our quietest player. And um, so uh, it, every so often I go, great, that's great, but what's Ratsnick doing now? And just throw to the players that are quieter who, I mean, you have to, Bear in mind, some people don't want to talk and they just want to sit in the background and don't want you to throw so to guys, them. Uh, so, guys, <laughs> so... Actually, um, we're, we're running out of time here, um, but I want to say a big thank you to all of you guys for, for coming along to us. Uh, come and find us. We'll be hanging around for a bit afterwards. You can come and have a chat if you want to. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, Podbean, um, pretty much anywhere where you look uh, for your are podcasts. Are we doing something tonight? We, what? Are we doing something tonight? Uh, doing something tonight? Yeah, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Aren't we, aren't we, aren't we aren't streaming we? tonight? Yeah. Are oh, we yeah. actually playing the game tonight, We're guys? We're actually <laughs> playing tonight on Twitch. So uh, we start playing at 7. So if you want to watch us play live as well as listen to us play, you can come and join in the Twitch stream. We'll be on the chat as well um, at Roll the Damn Dice. Um, but we've got a little treat for you. It might be a treat for you. Uh, so we've actually recorded a theme song, uh, which is going to start with our campaign in January. Um, and I sing the theme song. I sing the theme song. I'm the bard. You, you can sing it today. Um, and we thought we'd send you off with a little sneak peek of the full-length version of the song, which is basically an anthem for D&D players uh, everywhere. So um, we've got something really important to say, though. Uh, so guys, whatever you do this week, go out there and roll the damn dice. They said, keep who you are locked up inside. They said, make all your feelings run and hide. They told me, change everything you say and do. Then someday, we might come and talk to you. See, there's this thing, it's hard to explain. But I have a twisted and eccentric brain. When I start talking, people start to see. And they try not to stand too close to me. But I've never been the kind of girl who ever wanted to live in this oppressive world. I'll put on my mask, let the map unfurl. I'm a freak show, everybody should know. Let the party roll initiative and watch me go. Oh, cause devastation, cast fireball, take inspiration. Killing monsters is my only vice, so roll the damn dice. Obsessed 
With the things I watch on my TV With sci-fi and the strange allure of fantasy Did not leave playing games to my childhood A mix of lawful evil chaotic good But I don't know if you could ever see You ever falling for a geek like me I could be your DM, you'll be my PC I'll freak show Everybody should know. Let the party roll initiative and watch me go. Oh, the losers hit the deck as you roll your arcana check. Hope 11 hit points will suffice and roll the damn dice. It never is. <laughs> HP slips away as I face every foe. So come on, Paladine. freak show everybody should know let the party roll initiative and watch me go oh let's play some D and D and drown in vicious mockery we'll eat jaffa cakes and misbehave i'm a freak show i'm a freak show i'm a geek show maybe we'll save the day just pray it's not a tpk give me advantage and i'll roll this twice just roll the damn dice Thank you, lovelies. You've been brilliant. We're all the damn dice. Have a great weekend. Hello. Thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you liked it. If you didn't, I'm not sure why you're still here. But you know what? The credits are the best bit. Um, I am coming from the only videoable part of our pod dungeon. Um, it is a work in progress and uh, what we have been able to achieve wouldn't have been possible without all the donations we've had. As you can see, we've got some smashing shelves. Um, but we have got a little bit of a way to go because you don't want to see what's behind the camera. Um, uh, no offense. Um, it is all possible with the donations and if you want to make one uh, our ko-fi link is in the description um below me Ooh. Uh, we have got more uh, content coming and if you want to watch that or be notified of that um i think you are supposed to subscribe yes please and um smash the bell that's somewhere down here I said that right. Um, and then um, do the liking and um, and you will find out more about more content. Woo. Um, yeah. Love you. Bye.